Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's conversation with Interstellar Lovecraft and Ray Designs. This is one of our virtual programs in this year's M&T Bank Clothesline Online Festival. This festival has been the Memorial Art Gallery's largest fundraiser for more than 60 years. And although we've had to go virtual this year, our goals are still the same. We want to make sure we're highlighting and supporting the arts and our artists. So thank you all for joining us today. I just want to mention a few brief housekeeping items before we get started. After today's presentation, we will have time to answer questions that you've submitted for Brittany and Marissa. So be sure to submit your questions at any time by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will also be offering a recording of today's webinar later this week for anybody who couldn't join us live or who would like to watch again. And when we end our webinar today, your browser will take you to a short survey about your experience. So please let us know what you think. It's my pleasure to now introduce our artists that we have with us today. We have with us today, Brittany Ray of Ray Designs. Ray Designs was established in 2016. And she's now partnered in the Adorned Studios along with Marissa Kroll of Interstellar Lovecraft. We also have with us today Marissa Kroll of Interstellar Lovecraft, and she's the other half of the Adorned Studios, uh, where they're live from today. So Brittany and Marissa, I'll pass the mic to you now for your presentation, and thank you again for being with us today. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thanks for being here, everyone. Um, all right, so to get started. <laughs> yeah. um, so that was a nice little introduction um, of each one of us. Uh, so thank you, Bella. Um, so uh, to get started, I guess uh, I'm Brittany Ray of uh, Ray Designs, and this is hi. I'm Marissa Kroll of Interstellar Lovecraft, and uh, we both run the Adorn Studios together. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we'll we'll kind of begin talking a little bit about a little bit more about our background, and then kind of hopping into the Adorned and its um, its kind of its function and purpose in this like changing climate and um, kind of atmosphere that we've all collectively found ourselves in. Um, so I guess I'll I'll begin um, and talk a little bit about my my background. Um, so I I learned jewelry metal smithing in a kind of unconventional way, and that is through another artist, another local artist, Sharon Jenner, a little over ten years ago. And uh, I share that with you because that is like a key, a key part of like what it is we want to be presenting with the Adorn Studios is the ability to to do whatever it is like you feel like most drawn to, and whatever it is that inspires you, you can you can do that um, and not necessarily have. Although there's nothing wrong with a traditional academic background. Um, but it's, it's more of a, like, it's more of a movement. It's more like just kind of, um, jumping in and believing in something and following that through. And that's very much like how the Adorn Studios got started and a lot of like our message, um, to the community and, um, and to those who we have the opportunity to work with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so yeah, I guess I just kind of wanted to lead with that. Yeah. Um, Brett. <laughs> so the beautiful thing about the formation of the Adorn Studios is as much as Marissa um, was taken under the wing of Sharon, um, Marissa ended up doing the same for me. Uh, so about six years ago now, um, Marissa and I met and I showed an interest in jewelry making. It actually started with ceramics and I became more curious about metal smithing. And uh, with that, Marissa offered me a position as a resident artist through the Adorn Studios, uh, which she had already established um, with a, another artist who moved on to become a school teacher. Um, so I was able to work side by side with Marissa for a couple of years and just uh, work on developing myself as a jewelry maker and uh, create great designs. Um, and so that has been um, one of our main focuses with the Adorn Studios is to extend what others have done for us to our community and to help people grow. Uh, if they show a passion towards something, they we offer them a place for exploration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and we wanted this place itself to be as like available and accessible to all as possible. 
Um, we're in the process now of kind of adjusting some of, actually, I would say a lot of how we've been teaching, um, moving more towards a bit of a more of a private kind of like one on one sector. Um, we still are running classes through the Rochester Bringery outdoors at this time, um, a couple of months, uh, but kind of in tandem with that, our focus has shifted into um, private instruction, where we feel we can also kind of like, if someone is interested in the business side of things as well, or really taking this um, in a direction they didn't necessarily anticipate, which um, could be, yeah, it could be starting their own small business. It could just be making, you know, work for friends or family. Uh, we want to use our experience um, and kind of background to, to help like lift them up in whatever area they feel moved towards and compelled to. Um, uh, like really this, the Adorn Studios and jewelry making, um, for us, it's a it's an avenue, it's a it's a mode, it's a means of tapping into one's creativity, which um, I know I I've found you know it, we 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 speak from experience I guess like all of us and for me it's really helped me build my my confidence and my self of self worth and um, feeling like I'm able to put forth like good good energy and good work into this world. Um, and we want to enable, we want to create like a peaceful, safe environment where others can tap into those parts of themselves. And it, it you know, for some, it, it looks like sports. For others, like in the arts, it could be sculpting. Like there's so many different um, pathways for a person to like touch in with that and to touch into these, uh, these more peaceful, quiet, explorative places within themselves. And um, you know, our, our class space, um, is the the jewelry metal working version of that. Um, so that's that's kind of who we're looking to to serve. Um, and and it, it can it can look any number of ways. Um, and in the more kind of private instruction area right now, we're able to really focus on that one-on-one -on -one development or in, in small groups, like a mother, daughter, um, people who are already in close contact with one another through quarantine. Uh, we do have the, the space within our studio to be socially distant. I just realized I'm kind of sliding into the, another segment of this <laughs> um, and kind of how we're, you know, we're responding to like the, the current pandemic that we're, we're all in um, without abandoning that which we kind of like set out to build, which is a space for community. We just understand that community looks a little bit smaller right now. And there's still a place to, and, and really a need to channel like these, these parts of ourselves as we're processing a lot of like heaviness and a lot of societal upheaval, um, a, a place where we can go and um, like put, transmute that and turn it into something like positive and constructive and, and to be able, intangible too. Um, so I guess that's kind of like a little lead into some of our classes. Did I miss anything, Brett, there? Oh, I think that was a great, great job. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so one way that we are able to uh, make our classes more accessible to all is, um, the is by the way that we actually teach our classes. Um, so we have a number of introductory to metalsmithing classes available both uh, through the brainery and also through our website. Um, again, being whether they're private classes or with a small intimate group. Um, but regardless of what the class is, we always use the uh, same types of tools. So we've established a tool selection of um, of items that are easily accessible, whether from a local craft store, um, whether it be dance crafts and things, we uh, we utilize bead breakout, let's bead, um, as well as uh, larger places like Michael's. They all have really great options for um, for tools that we've been able to use in our studio. Um, we also use or go to like Harbor Freights. You know, it's uh, a lot of places have tools that are available. Um, and they don't need to be the most expensive tools out there. They're really great starter um, starter pieces or starter tools. 
And so we've been able to formulate a number of classes utilizing just these simple hand tools. Um, and anything else at the moment? Um, well, I, I guess, yeah, to what Britt was saying, yeah, that, that's always been very important to us to be able to like, you know, practice what we preach and, um, you know, as much as, you know, as jewelry designers yeah, over the course of time, we've accumulated a little bit more like specific and like um, kind of like more like heavy, like I'm lacking the word right now, um, more specified tools for to meet our needs. We both started with the bare bones basics and um, and it's really been exciting actually to see what that simple set of like seven eight tools what what we can come up with for projects and the different types of skills that we can teach um, within that that limited collection and to be able to say like hey you know there's no there's no secrets here like this is where you can find them and um they're not necessarily like as pricey as one would think and it's actually a really cool time to be doing this because there has been um, more of a recognized interest that that people are wanting to make things from scratch more and um, not just go beyond the the basics of like beading or assembling but taking it to um, like really like taking like a, just a raw material and forming it and manipulating it and turning it into something and the even prior to us doing this we were recognizing like oh wow some of these stores seem to really be carrying tools more designed for metalsmiths now. Um, and that, that made it so we could just say like, hey, go here, go there, and build, we too are building relationships with those shops in the process um, and supporting each other and what it is that we're trying to sort of extend because it's a similar, it's a similar passion, it's a similar interest. Um, and we have all of our classes um, updated which is a, also an ever-evolving, ever-shifting process on our website right now, with along with a little bit of information about um, sign-ups and prerequisites. Um, and um, we're happy to answer any questions as it relates to those. And if, if anybody has an interest too in learning things more, like a more specific kind of thing, we will do our best to accommodate that, that interest and that desire as well. So um, I think this is a good lead into um, talking about some of the tools that uh, I'm going to be using today. I'm going to do a brief dem demonstration. Um, and uh, so these, this is one of the greatest like starter packs that we can, um, that we've been able to put together. So these are the basic tools that anyone can pretty much use to um, just begin their journey along metalsmithing. Um, so to walk you through some of these tools, um, today I'm using a bench block, it's a stainless steel bench block. Um, I'm using that anytime that I am doing um, any hammering. So today I also have a ball peen hammer. Um, so a ball peen hammer is uh, domed on one side and flat on the other. Um, and a variety of uh, pliers. So I have like a square tip plier, uh, a needle nose plier, and a rounded plier. Um, all of them can be utilized for different bending techniques, um, as well as a um, pair of snips. Um, and lastly, I have a diamond tip file. So this is just a, a standard file for jewelers. Um, it's nice and fine. Um, you can also use any variety of files uh, when working with metal or sandpaper, if that's what's available to you. Um, today, I'm going to be showing how to make the one collective part pin. Um, this is a pin that I've actually been able to utilize in a lot of really great ways to uh, do some fundraising for different um, groups. And um, I'm actually currently offering it again um, in support of the BLM movement. Um, and Marissa and I will be talking a little bit more about that coming up. Um, so to start off, um, I'm using a, a 18 gauge wire today. Um, so I'm going to be creating a pin. Um, so to show a little bit, I'm going to just oh, that's a great idea. put the screen down so we can actually see um, my hands here. So I'm going to start off by filing this end down. So anywhere that I snip, I want to make sure that I'm filing. Um, 
just so that we get to have a nice base to start off with and um, we aren't ending up with any sharp ends. All right, so I'm just going nice and around the edge of the, um, the wire and I'm just checking to make sure that I don't feel any rough spots. All right, so next I'm going to create the first part of um, the clasp for our pin. So I'm just bending that wire around uh, my round plier, okay, and creating this little loop, followed by doing a slight twist. So Marissa is going to show here having the what I am ending up with. Final project here. All right, is our pin yeah. in its completed state. So currently, I'm working at this end right here. So I'm going to do a nice little wrap with my wire using my hands. And then I'm also going to utilize my second pair of pliers to do a wrap. Oops. And I'm just going to tighten that up a little bit. So I have the first start of my pin. Next, I'm going to be doing this design within here. So we'll add a couple bumps here. And this is meant to like mimic like a heart rate. Right, an EKG. EKG. Um, so the whole idea behind the One Collective Heart Pin, um, it started during the a time when I felt like we were all disconnecting as a human race. And I wanted to create something that could help benefit everyone and be a reminder that in the end, um, we are all of one collective heart. We are all here together and here to benefit one another with each other. Um, yeah, and it's important to, you know, as, as one is kind of, you know, making this project a good example of that is to try to connect with that energy and, and that, that truth, um, especially during periods of um, a lot of turmoil and a lot of feelings of like separation and loneliness that um, the, that's, that's a lie. The reality is we are all one living, breathing organism like and needing, needing to adapt, needing to evolve at a rapid rate right now and to really um, practice, um, practice love in some, in some pretty radical ways. Mm -hmm. So here I have the first part of my pin. So now I'm going to just hammer um, this metal down. Um, this is going to add some strength. Metal likes to be compressed. Uh, the more it's compressed, the stronger it can be. Um, so at this point, I'm going to just focus in on these, um, the bends primarily to make sure that everything has a little strength to it. Classes do get a little loud. <laughs> we can let out some frustrations. <laughs> Shape. Yeah. So now at this point, I'm going to be creating this um, the little coil to create the back part of the pin. So again, I'm using my round file or round pliers, and I'm just going to do a couple spins around those. Now, because I want the pin to have um, a little security when the pin is closed, I'm going to keep it open slightly. Um, and before I do any cutting or anything, I'm going to form this part of the wire so that I create a little hook for the pin back to be able to grab onto. Um, to do that, I'm going to create a little bend so it's like a lip for the pin itself to grab on. And then I'm going to just do a rotation here. Can you make it look so simple? 
And then I'm going to trim down this wire here. So using my snips, I'm just going to place my snips right at the point where I want to cut. I'm going to cover and hold so that I don't accidentally um, fling that wire anywhere else. I'm going to double check that my pin length is correct. It looks like it's going to hold on nicely there. So now I'm just going to file this end just so that it has a bit of a point so that it can pierce through any clothing. Just want to say a little something about um, our classes and kind of the, the style that we both instruct in and it's it's one that allows the students a lot of freedom to take the projects into whatever direction um, their hands and heart like allow it to go. Um, so we'll give you like the basic set of skills and from there uh, it's a, you know a combination of one's own personal creativity, their own voice, um, maybe a little bit of troubleshooting along the way. Um, everyone will leave with a with a successful outcome and a successful project um, and that that looks that looks a lot of different ways and it's always really cool like at the end of class um, for the students and for us to kind of like look around the room and look at the projects that have been that have like come to life here and see how unique they are see how there are like commonalities um, but at the same time, they're all like their own, their own expression, their own extension of the maker um, and what it, what it is that they are wanting to kind of like convey. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's that was a, a perfect example nice of a little thing. quick little project. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like I had mentioned before, um, Marissa and I have tried to utilize uh, what we do as um, artists and educators to benefit those around us. And one way that we've been able to do that is to create uh, jewelry lines that are, um, are meant to help build and benefit um, any number of organizations that we've, we've felt compelled to work with. Mm -hmm. um, so like I mentioned, these pins in the past had, um, I was able to fundraise and uh, donate money to the uh, Breast Research uh, Foundation, the ACLU, the um, National Resource Defense Council, um, and most recently, uh, some organizations such as uh, Save Lives in Rochester um, and the Black Lives Matter Rochester. Um, and Marissa has also been able to benefit quite a few, if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, we've always felt, um, we've always been moved by what is kind of happening around us and um, in, you know, raising up social consciousness as it um, as it develops and unfolds, and um, most recently, um, when we both participated in in uh, online auctions and um, benefits and fundraisers um, to really help out with what's going on downtown in Rochester right now with the protests and um, free the people who's doing who are doing such a tremendous job. Um, leading that, um, especially that there's a few like really strong women in in um, positions there that are really working hard with um, with attendees to make sure we're a unified front and um, that the right message is getting across. Mm -hmm. So um, them, for example, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, as well as uh, Yoga for a Good Hood and some smaller community-based organizations, the AIR Project, um, as, and some bigger kind of like larger, um, like kind of um, like dealing with the institutional side of things, the, the Bell Project, for example. Um, and I'm, I know I'm missing a couple. Both donated to the Loveland Foundation. The Loveland Foundation, um, which works to provide therapy to young black and brown women. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, as things are unfolding, like we're, our eyes are opening and um, we're just trying to find more ways to get involved and give back and show up. Um, we're, we're working on developing a scholarship fund right now um, for um, teens and underserved communities. Mm -hmm. um, more information to come on that soon as, as we're working out the details. 
it's a little tricky right now. We had every intention of like getting into some of the, the city schools and introducing some of these projects and in, in, the, in the art classrooms, but all of that's been on hiatus. So we're trying to figure out what we can do in this kind of limbo in between space to, um, to help like educate and uplift those who, um, those who need it most. So with that, if you happen to know any, um, any young people um, in those communities who are, are showing an interest in the arts or even more specifically in jewelry making, we would love their contact info. We'd love to be in touch with them to have a conversation and um, to see what we could, we could do, what we could set up in terms of like further instruction and to help them you know, develop these parts of themselves that are, are shining early. And one way that we um, have tried to navigate this slightly is um, we are now offering um, our class demonstrations. So much like I just made the pin, a lot of times during our classes, Marissa or myself will end up actually making a physical jewelry item. So we've um, created a line of those demo, demo pieces that are now um, available for purchase and proceeds from those purchases are being used to um, to sponsor a student. Um, so that will pay for the cost of their materials and of the like. Um, so that's that's one of our offerings that we've been able to come through with. Um, yeah. And more to come there is like more information comes. Um, you know, this time as you know the news is changing daily, like there's just so much shifting around. Like we're finding like even within the scope of our business and this thing that we're co-creating together. You know that on a daily basis we have like new ideas new inspiration new ways to participate and to extend and to connect um, and we're excited to be you know on that journey and hopefully you know bringing others along with us um, and growing together yeah so in the meantime um, while we do navigate this as a community all together um, we would love to remind you that we do offer um, some private classes available on our website. Um, we are still working with the brainery as much as we can with the, the weather changing. It's changing the looks of that as well, but um, for the time being, we are still running through classes with them. Um, and we also have open studio hours or open shop hours here at the Adorn Studios. Um, we've been re uh, regularly here Wednesdays through Fridays um, from 11 till 3 and then until 6 on Thursdays. Um, so if you find yourself in the area and you just want to see what we're doing or see what we're about, feel free to stop by, say hi. Uh, we'd love to have a visit. We do ask that everyone wears a mask though. <laughs> <laughs> and we are, we are sanitizing, we are following um, COVID pro protocol. Even in our, our classes, we um, do have plexiglass screens that we'll use for certain projects where we need to be a little bit more up close and personal. Um, otherwise, we, we do have room to comfortably accommodate um, up to four people socially distant. Um, so we're trying and <laughs> thanks for trying along with us. <laughs> um, it looks like we have a couple oh, yeah, questions, questions here. So I'll ask you guys some of the questions that came in. Thank you so much for telling us about the work you guys do together and separately. I think it's really amazing how um, much you're prioritizing working with the community. And I think it's also awesome that you guys are looking to provide tools for people to learn more about the materials that you guys work with. I think that's that really helps give more accessibility to people who really want to like learn some of the skills in your trade that you guys do. Um, so I'm just going to ask you if if that sounds good, some of the questions that we have so far from our audience members. And again, guys, feel free to send in questions. We do have some time now um, to answer any questions that you have. Um, one listener is wondering, do you have a favorite class that you guys teach? So that is, um, I, I feel like for myself, it's probably the geometric hoops class. Um, so that was, I think the first class that I ever started teaching, and you would think that after teaching it so many times, I might get sick of it, but I actually really love it. And I love it sim simply because through teaching it so many times, I've been able to find the best way to educate students and how to convey a certain um, skill set or um, and guide them through the process pretty seamlessly. 
So, and I love seeing the creativity that students come up with. Um, the class itself is very simple, but seeing the um, designs that everyone come, brings forward are just incredible and they're so unique. And it's great to see everyone's kind of personality come out a little bit in those classes. Yeah, there's definitely something to be said for that repetition mm -hmm. um, and just kind of finding like new ways of presenting uh, same material, but um, more precisely. And especially now during this age of social distancing, we have to rely so much more on our use of language. Whereas in the past, we could just be like, oh, hey, look, this is this is how that looks. Now it's like, okay, I can do drawings from a distance and let me see if I can try to describe that in a different way. Um, I've actually enjoyed that. It's like pushed me, um, it's pushed me to further develop that part of my teaching style. Um, and with that, in terms of like favorites, um, I have to say like, I think of every class I've had like a favorite, like a favorite group, a favorite set of memories, just like a really great night. I can't say it's any one project exactly. Um, what I, I really love is when someone's, you know, maybe having a little bit of difficulty and then some, and some just, they just break through it. They like suddenly get it or they feel like they made a mistake and now they're looking at that project a little bit differently and just taking it in a new direction and leave like happy or at least satisfied with the outcome. Um, I think there's a lot of great learning in that, like just kind of being flexible and like responding to what the moment's asking of us. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I think that's a great sentiment that thinking that you made a mistake doesn't necessarily have to be a mistake. It's just a turning point maybe. Yeah, right. well, yeah. exactly. And not sometimes not seeing how the project's going to come together until the very end. Mm -hmm. And then just seeing that spark in people's eyes of like, wow, I just created this. Yeah. And it's just really exciting it's and gratifying. Yeah. yeah. That's just, awesome. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, and I know Britt has said this, I have said it too. Like, you guys inspire us. Yeah. Like, sometimes in these classes, we leave and we're just all sorts of fired up and we <laughs> to get back into the studio ourselves just yeah. because of the energy and what we were able to support and like bear witness to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, question for you guys also, mm -hmm. uh, just jumping off of that, do you have um, favorite things that you teach how to make? Or, you know, Brittany, do you focus on one type of object for creating? And Marissa, do you teach a different kind of object to create when you give your classes or do you give them together? Yeah, yeah. well, the ones we don't, we, we do co-teach some of our classes, which that has its own like excitement to yeah. it or just like passing the mic, like yeah. I mean, not an actual mic. We're just like, you know, tag <laughs> teaming it. Like, yeah. and, and that's great fun. Yeah. Um, it does seem like you focus more on like the hand tool mm -hmm. kinds of yeah. skills. Whereas, Definitely like hold connections and yeah. just like simple, simple designs, a lot of beginner classes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I really like, um, I, I really enjoy teaching different types of stamping classes because I feel like a lot can be expressed with symbols and with words and with letters. Um, it also um, gets the hammer kind of involved, like get, getting a couple different types of hammer skills whether it be texturing the material or like adding like impressions of things. I think that's a lot of who a person is can come through um, using like those kinds of materials. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Do you have your own stamps that you guys develop for um, stamping jewelry or how do you get your stamps? Yeah. Um, gosh, now it's been like, you know, 10 years of accumulation. So <laughs> There are a lot of stamps. There's hundreds. <laughs> um, you know, some of it is is uh, student feedback. Like I kept hearing for years, like, do you have a pop, like a paw print? And that this was before I really, before I was, I'm now a dog owner, and it was before I was an animal owner, and I was like, oh, fucking paw print. I mean, <laughs> here's how you can do it using these other shapes, like using some circles and some things like that. And I think that's really good creative problem solving. But then, like, as soon as this puppy came into my life, I'm like. I'm getting a paw print. <laughs> so like each kind of has its own little story like that. Or, you know, most recently I acquired some like little olive branches. So these like little kind of like leaf forms um, as a result of collaborating with another local artist on a, a series of pieces. Um, so that kind of entered the mix. And then I found like, oh, that feels very relevant right now. And like 
just passing piece. Um, so it's also shown up in some like fundraiser pieces. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered the question there. It's kind of, yeah. No, that was great. <laughs> I I, that's, that's awesome. And I think just your story or how you just explained how you get your stamps goes along with a lot of your creative process and energy, you know, that energy then comes through those stamps, through the stories that mm. are behind how you get each one. Um, so yeah, we have another question for you guys. Uh, what is your advice for someone who wants to create jewelry, but doesn't consider themselves as an artist? Um, like they don't draw, they've never really explored creativity with any materials. Um, what advice, advice do you have for them? Just try. I mean, in and, and try something out. It's once you get your hands active, um, a lot can start to be developed. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the first step is just putting yourself out there. It's a little scary at first, but once you get into the classroom and you feel pliers in your hand for the first time and you start to bend wire and see how it re reacts to your motions, um, it's, it's really exciting. And um and coming out with something that you've created that is beautiful because we'll always make sure that you end up with something successful and that's that you enjoy um that's one of our guarantees in class it might might be a roundabout way of getting there but mm -hmm. we will always get you to a place where you're satisfied um and so just just starting off small starting off um and it's fine to have have start with uh some, smaller expectations but to just get yourself out there and to just try i mean that yeah. would be my that's my first advice and that's really great advice mm -hmm. and you know to add to that um with the trying it's you know we are all like inherently artists we are all creative people we are all problem solvers mm -hmm. that's something we all share uh, whether or not this is a medium that you feel really comfortable with um that's that's like, it's up to you putting in the time and exploring that and seeing how it feels. I know both Britt and I have a background in so many different like modalities of like art and art media. Um, this is, this is where we are now. This may not be where we always are. Um, but you know, an openness to learn, I think those are, those can be the best student experiences, mm -hmm. honestly is being like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm here and I chose to be here. Yeah. You've already done the hard part, the yeah. showing up and, and that and, takes courage. And then we step in and we're here yeah. to assist you. And we're like, you got this, yeah. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I think that's great advice for anybody who wants to explore, you know, any kind of medium that they're not sure about. You just gotta, you just gotta do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and also do it without judgment of yourself. That's the hardest part, I think. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying something new, and I try to reiterate this in my classes all the time, it's like, this might be the first time you've ever done this. And so this is your starting point. So you'll just grow from here. And so just because it doesn't come out perfect the first time doesn't mean the second time is not going to be better. You know, it's like, so just building upon what you've grown, you've learned. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where true growth comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, one more question for you guys from the audience. Um, how do you create when you aren't feeling inspired? Mm, that's a big one. <laughs> a, classic, a classic big question for you. So I think that both Marissa and myself have, um, within our uh, lines of jewelry, we have some pieces that have been staples. And so I know for myself, um, when I maybe I'm not feeling inspired to create a, a whole new line or um, or push through an idea. Um, I'll go back to some of the basics. So mm -hmm. I have things like bangles and hairpins and they, people constantly are requesting them. And so I just, whenever I'm not feeling motivated or inspired, I'll just sit at my bench and I'll start bending wire and make some of those. And then as I'm making them, another idea might pop up and then I'll put that aside and I'll start working on the new focus. Um, and it's just a way to keep my hands busy and keep myself going. And um, and a lot of times when you're when you're working on something that you've done so many times over and over again, it allows your your brain some rest and some space for it to create some new connections and ideas. And absolutely, so, yeah, I'll come from that that direction. 
Yeah, yeah, kind of, I, I, I would agree um, with what Brett, everything Brett said there really, kind of like returning to what needs to get done. Um, I don't like entirely disconnecting from the medium for too long. Like I definitely notice, like it's a relationship. I have a relationship with metal. And if we spend too many days apart, like we're a little like rusty when we get re reacquainted. <laughs> so um, it takes some like refamiliarizing. And sometimes I'm not feeling all that inspired when I go up into the studio, but I know there's work to get done. I know there's things to be prepped. And um, uh, Mother Teresa has this, there's this great quote, um, and it kind of goes a little something like this. I know I'm paraphrasing, but um, first do, do what you do what you can, then do what's possible, and before long you'll be doing the impossible. And sometimes the impossible feels like creativity because it's not anything that we can control or define. It finds us and it just passes through us. But I don't think that happens without effort. You have to show that you're invested. Um, you have to show that you care. Um, and and then it and then when it, it rolls in, you're prepared because you're not rusty. And you've also shown that like that you you've shown the work that you love it. You've shown the, the material that you love it. And um, and then you, that, that can be like the reward is like all of a sudden just getting struck with this new inspiration. So I, I think that's kind of that's a big misconception with artists is, oh, you're just all like, woo, just constantly out there getting new ideas. It's that's not true at all. Um, it's devotion. And it's also seeking sometimes. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that it's taken me sometimes to step away completely in order to reground myself, maybe go, go away for a weekend. You know, it's like, go take a walk on the beach, take a walk in the woods, um, find inspiration elsewhere. And that can oftentimes channel itself back into the work. Yeah, absolutely. Like refinding yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's also vital. It's like uh, the combination of these two opposing things. It's diving in deeper and completely disconnecting. Mm -hmm. And both are essential. That's a great answer from both of you guys. <laughs> and that quote is great too from Mother Teresa. I mean, that's, that's a great way to think about it too and approach it, you yeah. know? And you're right, like creativity isn't just like a thing that comes naturally to artists all the time, 24 seven, just they have a cloud above them, you know, ready to pull from, you gotta work at it. Um, and then one last question for you guys before we end our program today, what are some of your goals or future projects that you have in the works? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say like developing this scholarship program, that's like, it's really feeling like it um, is, pushing through right now mm -hmm. and figuring that out and like what that looks like. It's like, and it's all a little trickier again during like this sort of social distancing time and, you know, finding those students that, you know, are seeking this kind of learning and this kind of development um, and preparing for them. I think that's really what we need to do now in many cases, like all of us, like preparing for what's next. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, moving kind of into that, um, and then, um, in conjunction with that, um, I have been talking with the brainery about, uh, creating home kits, mm. um, and offering classes that, um, can be, you'll follow along in a similar format as this, um, and I'll teach you a class, but you'll have the tools at your hands. Um, and you'll be able to either purchase a toolkit or rent a toolkit, um, and that will go along with the class. And then you'll have the ability to sign up for, for a couple different classes. Um, so that's still in the works. We're hoping to shoot for like November, or December for that one. Uh, but something to look out for. That's really cool. That's awesome. Now is definitely the time for at home kits and classes, you know. Exactly. Sure. Yeah, because we want to still encourage the creativity. Um, and with people having a little bit more time on their hands or time at home, it's like what better way than to get yourself prepared with exactly the tools that you're going to need to kind of find your journey. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Marissa, Brittany, thank you so much for being with us today and for telling us about your work. I'm gonna share my screen real quick with our audience so they can see where to find your work and your classes. So 
Everybody, if you'd like to support Brittany Ray Designs Online and Interstellar Lovecraft Online, their websites are listed here for you. You can also sign up for their classes and check out what else they have at the Adorned Studios website. And of course, um, please check out our clothesline hub to see what else we have planned for today. Uh, it's thanks to your support that we're able to have this festival online. And we're sad that we can't be together in person, but we're really excited to be able to bring our artists to you in this virtual format. So you can find other events that we have planned. You can find our 2020 clothesline t-shirt at our hub. Um, M&T Bank is doing a matching challenge if you'd like to donate to the museum. And we also have $15 off our memberships all week long in the spirit of clothesline. So you can find all of that there. You can also find our, a full listing of our 2020 artists for this year on our hub as well. So you can find Brittany and uh, Marissa on there as well. And you can also vote for your favorite artist for 2020 for a Visitor's Choice Merit Award. So be sure to check out our hub. And um, Marissa and Brittany, thank you again for your presentation today. You guys are awesome. You have so much in the works and I'm excited to see what happens throughout the rest of this season and the rest of the year. So thank you again for presenting with us today and I hope you guys have a great day. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you for having us. Thanks everyone. Bye. Everyone. Bye. Thank you.